Taxonomy is the science of naming, describing, and classifying organisms. The taxonomy that I'm going to talk with you tonight about is not familiar to the majority of people on this planet, at least not yet. But I think that the contact in the desert audiences are people who do not believe humans are alone in this vast universe, and no matter what policies of denial governments have used to keep the public and media ignorant on purpose, that you all with me, I think, fundamentally feel that if there was any subject on this planet that all seven billion humans deserved would be to know what their so-called authorities and leaders are keeping from them about other life in the universe and what it does on this planet. Why have there been decades of secrecy about such a fundamentally important fact that we humans are not alone in this universe? And I think that the reason emerged recently in a Ministry of Defense transition through the National Archive in England, and this included information about Prime Minister Churchill and American General Dwight Eisenhower and U.S. President Harry S. Truman. They were afraid that if they talked publicly about what they were learning in World War II, that it would panic the public if they told the truth about what they called at the time, and you find this in some of the documents, even as far back as Roosevelt. A lot of people aren't aware of this. George Marshall, the Secretary of War, and FDR were talking about celestial craft and beings in documents that we now have. And here is a letter excerpt to the Ministry of Defense in England dated October 4th, 1999, it was about a scientist father who worked as security guard for Prime Minister Winston Churchill. The son reported to the MOD that his father overheard Churchill tell then General Eisenhower about a silver metallic disc that shocked an RAF pilot with its aerial maneuvers. In fact, the distinction that, or the details that were given is that a disc was doing this around a Royal Air Force fighter that was near the German border and that it was uh, considered to be moving at a rate in circles around a jet that was moving in the air that was pr uh, completely beyond any aerial ability of humans at the time. The security guard, whose son is the scientist who uh, communicated this to the MOD, heard Prime Minister Churchill say to Eisenhower, that, quote, the incident should be immediately classified for at least 50 years. That would be two generations, and that would have been around 1994, because that was in 1944. And now it is 70 years later in 2014, and the reason for suppression of truths and facts has changed from Churchill's possibly noble worries about panic to a 1% elite that is keeping octopus tentacles around their power greed superiority over the dumbed down and poor 99% mass, which is us. I have been a TV producer, writer, director, editor, and investigative reporter since graduating from Stanford University in Palo Alto, California with a master's degree in communication in 1968. And there I made a documentary film for the Stanford Medical Center, and my master's thesis was a picture calculus about the very first efforts to use computers to analyze atomic particle bombardment images at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. So I was grounded in science and environment and medicine right from the very beginning in my work at Stanford. And a decade later, I was working as director of special projects at the CBS affiliate KMGH-TV Channel 7 in Denver, Colorado. And that's where I produced the film A Strange Harvest about the worldwide bloodless, trackless animal mutilations that first broadcast on May 25, 1980. And today, in this workshop about a taxonomy of extraterrestrial entities, I'm going to present illustrations and information from human abductees, whistleblowers, and alleged government documents, 
even if I cannot yet prove everything that I'm going to share with you with hard evidence, which is always my goal. But in this field, it's a razor blade field, and it's very difficult. In 1994, my second book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, was published with a 50-page taxonomy of extraterrestrial entities that came from all of the illustrations from people that I had interviewed who had been in the abduction syndrome. And could I've always asked people to draw for me the entities, the craft, details as much as possible. And that was a visual taxonomy that included color and black and white. And I grouped together different types of alien beings by shape and color, because that's all I had to work with, with little understanding about the relationship of the beings to each other. And I'm going to go through and show you some of the images from that taxonomy in Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1. And for people who are asking, my books weigh about four pounds each, and that's why I don't ship them around. But since 1999 and my work at earthfiles.com, the news website, there's a shop. It has documentaries I've done. It has my four books. They've been the same price since 1999. They're always there. They're always available. So go to earthfiles.com and check out the Earth Files shop. Now, in this taxonomy in Glimpses, Volume 1, these were drawn by a teenager named Cindy Tyndall, in, uh, who in Houston, Texas, May 1973, was with her mom, Judy Doherty, and three other members of their family when they were arguing about what was a moving light in the sky, pulled over the car, and what, experience, what they experienced is that everybody in the car was put in a state of suspended animation, uh, sort of like the Betty Andresen case, except that Judy Doherty, and she didn't know at the time, she discovered later her teenager, teenage daughter, were taken up in a pale beam of yellow light. And on board, they watched snake-eyed gray creatures. You've got one in the upper right here, drawn by Cindy, they had an insect entity and another being with large black eyes who seemed more gentle and kind. The non-human entities all worked in a lab excising tissues from the calf that they saw rising in the pale yellow beam of light into the disk where they ended up. Cindy, the teenager, and Judy were both examined. Swabs of tissue was taken from inside of their mouth. Cindy also sketched this mushroom-headed being that had narrow oriental-looking eyes with vertical pupils. And this non-human also worked with tubes in a round laboratory room during the abduction with her mother and the calf from the Houston pasture. So you've got a mixture in this one case of different types of shaped heads, eyes, and heights. Now. Here, completely different type, Memphis, Tennessee, 1980s. An adult male encountered this tall, red-haired being during an abduction. Similar red-haired types have been described by abductees in Nevada, Southern California, and the Andes Mountains of Peru. And I would like to digress for a moment to tell you about an extraordinary experience that I had in Peru in 1987. I was there for a month. And I went down after uh, talking with a, uh, Brian uh, Frazier, who had, uh, or James Frazier, who had been sort of monitoring and trying to collect data on the famous Brian Scott case. And he brought over to my office in Denver whole volumes of material that he was collecting that included 16 millimeter film of Brian Scott, the abductee changing personalities, changing voices, talking like a computer. Uh, was downloading data at such a rate that they tape recorded him and had it transcribed. And when they had the transcription of mathematical data and formulas that no nobody understood that was doing the investigation, least of all Brian Scott, they 
ended up sending this information to somebody in uh, the UFO field who was investigating abductions, and they ended up getting an angry phone call from an astronomer in Ireland called Duncan Lunan, and he was raging at the uh, Jim Frazier saying, you have no right to steal my work. It, I am preparing this manuscript to be published, and you are putting out all of my work and my math, and I want to know how you got it. That's true, literal. I talked with Brian Scott about this. I talked with Jim Frazier about this. Here they downloaded in this abduction scenario information that was to a T identical to what this astronomer was preparing in his private office in Ireland. And the story is huge. It involved a trip to Peru. Uh, Brian Scott appeared to be taking on different forms, seemed to be talking from the point of view of Vera Kocha. It's a very complex, amazing case. Jim Frazier, in 1987, had contacted me about trying to do a documentary about the Brian Scott case, and I was getting ready to go on this trip to Peru. And he said, you must go to Pia Pinte. This is outside of Cusco, up in the Andes. And he said, I know an archaeologist. And he lives in Cusco. His father worked as a medical nurse. In Peru, they did not have hospitals, but they had medical nurses that would travel on a route. Sometimes it would take a a year or two years for them to go around villages. And one of those villages, Pia Pinte, the archaeologist's father had been about five years before Jim is talking to me. And he said, this man that I want you to uh, hook up with, the archaeologist, he heard his father, the medical person, ask him, the archaeology student at the time, why would there be tall Shirley MacLaine's in Pia Pinte. <laughs> and the son said, what are you talking about? And the father said, I was there on one of our medical, and there were these, uh, they must have been six to seven feet tall. And their skin was white as white cotton sheet. And their eyes were crystal blue. And their hair was copper red and long. And he said, we dealt, we tried to deal with who are they? So I get to Peru, I go to this office, I find this son, I explain that Jim Frazier and Brian Scott have asked me to come. Can he take me to Pia Pinte? Well, the Sandinera Luminosa in June of 1987, when I was there, were blowing up the trains going south to Lake Titicaca. They were blowing up bridges and roads up in the mountains. And he said, Linda, I don't know. I don't know if we can get to Pia Pinte without being blown up or arrested. And I said, this would be my one trip. Let's try it. And we went out, and we rented a taxi. And it was like for two days. And it was something like 30 US dollars to drive all the way up into the Andes looking for these red-haired extraterrestrials. And this really happened. We are on the road. Uh, we get to a particular spot. The security guard stops us this way. Guns. We're in this taxi. And the archaeologist speaks in uh, Spanish. And uh, he's, I could hear uh, that I was this American and a journalista. And I was on trying to meet these red-haired extraterrestrials. And I'm thinking, oh, God, the policeman is going to turn us back right now. Honest to God, the policeman said, yo sé, yo sé, extraista. And the policeman now starts telling the archaeologist about their encounters with beams, discs, and that they know all about these red-haired extraterrestrials in Pia Pinte. And now I'm thinking, you know, my, my adrenaline starts <laughs> Are you prepared to deal with seven-foot-tall extraterrestrials? We drive 
further, it was very treacherous. It was just like this. There's no guardrails. There's nothing. And there would be places where I'd be looking straight down thinking, Holy Father, please help me. <laughs> and we get to another, more police, more police, blue lights. They're out in the middle of the road and they're stopping. And we went through the same exact thing. Only this policeman had more information. We were closer to Pia Pinto. He knew all about the red-haired extraterrestrials, said that if we had the time to go up to the mountain right above Pia Pinte, that he, the police officer, had been up there where a silver disc had landed and that there was this huge oval and that it had uh, sunk into the ground, there was this depression, and that we should go up and see where this silver disc had been. So we kept on driving. And we got to, to say a village, I'm not sure that Americans understand. We're, t we're talking about, you know, there's like a few little buildings and a few little houses, but you are up in the Andes, like at the end of the world, and the only other thing beyond this village is this other tall peak. And I said to the archaeologist, how, how long do you think it would take us to climb that mountain. And he said, probably two days. <laughs> so we, we keep going, and the next thing that happens, we had slowed down, it's the taxi, and at least 40 children started running toward us, surrounded the car, literally surrounded the car, and the archaeologist got out by himself and he talked to everybody. And the children sort of backed away into a group. And I got out, and the taxi cab driver uh, pulled the taxi up while we walked with the children sort of around us. So now we are entering Pia Pinte for the first time in this group of children from the village. And the archaeologist is asking the children, where are the red-haired extraterrestres? And you could hear all of this chatter, and the children are doing this. And he said, I think there's one in this house. Do you want to go knock on the door? And honestly, you know, the, <laughs> the adrenaline. <laughs> and I said yes. And uh, while we're walking with the children just now, now all agitated, um, I'm thinking in my head, well, Linda, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, give me a chance to get your telepathic download. Please don't zap me out. Please don't abduct me. Just, just do it more slowly and let me see. I'm thinking all these thoughts as we are walking toward this house. And when we get there, it is a solid lapis blue door. It is extraordinarily beautiful and eerie at the same time amid the other little houses. The archaeologist knocked on the door. God is my witness. What opened up that door? He was about my height, five foot two. And instead of having all of the dark brown hair of everybody, there were all this copper red swaths. Uh, uh, Travis Walton kind of hair. Do you know what I mean? And all of the other children and everybody that we had met, they had dark brown eyes, and we're looking at almost sky blue. It was a blue that was so intense in these uh, faces with this copper brushed through this hair. But here's the other. Coming up, like if you put milk in coffee, and you just start the turn and it starts to swirl, imagine that you're looking at skin that has what looks like a swirl of cream in coffee. And I was so, I was just stunned. And I said to the archaeologist, ask him who his parents are. They talk, and th this guy says, go to this house. We'll ask him if he knows where the tall, red-haired extraterrestrials. Points up to the mountain, 
and they're talking about how that they've been up there, but that the extraterrestrials that used to live in the village aren't there anymore, but his parents knew them very well. So now we walk to another, and it's another lapis door. They were the only lapis doors. We knock, the door opens, and it could be his cloned twin. It was the same thing, this copper red going all through this hair, these strange, eerie, beautiful sky blue eyes, and all of this mulatto sort of skin. And there we learned, because this was a slightly older person, somehow was related to the other man, maybe a father. You would never have believed it. They didn't look aged. They just looked slightly different. And the father said that, yes, he had communicated with what they called the, it was extraterrestre, estrella, or something like that, meaning stars. They were from red-haired people from the stars, that they had known them, that they had come and helped them in the village, that they had uh, a disc, that they came and went from the top of the mountain, but they were gone. But yes, if we wanted to spend two days, they would be happy to take us up to the top of the mountain to see this oval at the top. When you are in Cusco, which we finally got back to the next day, and you go into the market, the people who sell the cocoa leaves are called pintes. They come from Pia Pinte. And what are you looking at? They're all female, and, and their hair, just like those guys at the doors, have all of this copper red. That's what they're called. And the locals refer to the red hair of the pintes who sell the cocoa leaves. I'm setting the stage for this whole question about the cloning, the hybridization, which I'm going to talk about in great deal, detail on Monday, but the idea that on this planet, in cultures such as Peru, the idea of mixed blood with extraterrestrials is not foreign to them at all, and that there was a sense of, if I had just been there maybe a month or two earlier, I could have shaken the hand of, <laughs> had a telepathic download with these tall red hairs that in that, in our, if we could go back to the slide picture, because now I'm gonna go back to lots of slides. Something like this is part of the abduction syndrome and what is the relationship between, between the tall red hairs, the tall blondes, the tall black hairs, the tall whites, and a whole series of others that I'm now going to continue to go through. Now, this is a fascinating case that I go into great depth in Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2. This was a New Jersey 1987 case, and this involved the abductee, the main concentration of the abductee, was a black woman who was with her family traveling at Thanksgiving time on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, right out of Harrisburg. They had stopped and gotten gas. Two cars, because there were seven family members and they had five in one car and two and they were uh, tailing each other. They knew that they got the gas. Both cars, both drivers had the receipts of the gas from the gas station, I saw both of them, on this day and both cars, seven people, the very next memory is there 200 and some miles away in New Jersey. Any of us experiencing something like that would go crazy wondering what happened. It took a while, she ended up asking people, she worked in a mayor's office and she had um, great concern that if anybody knew that she had been involved in any kind of an abduction, she would lose her job. So we had to work together extremely uh, carefully, and I have never ever used her real name or which city or, but she was working in a mayor's office. And 
when they got aboard, all of the family members and both cars were in a craft, but she is the only one that they seemed to be interested in. The whole family was left in a state of suspended animation. She saw that with little grays going around her family while she was taken with the seven foot tall blonde female humanoid that had what she called white pearlescent translucent skin. Some people have said it reminds them of marble. Think of very fine marble that is white and has a kind of bluish cast. The New Jersey female abductee thought that the male's eyes were more golden and the females a pale crystal blue, but she compared both of their eyes to a cat's in which there are vertical dark pupils and no white showing. The female abductee stressed that when she first saw the tall male humanoid, that his eyes were solid black. Quote, he took something off his eyes like shields and there were cat eyes underneath, close quote. In the lower right corner down here, are two overlapping what would be triangles without bases inside of a circle. And these were on the uh, uniforms or leotard like jumpsuits of two of the very tall beings that she was dealing with. And when she uh, asked telepathically or thought, what does this mean? The answer came back into her head, quote, the merging of two worlds, close quote. She did not know which two worlds or why. Let's assume that the Earth might be one of those two, but what is the interaction? What would be the merging of two worlds and why? That same New Jersey female also sketched this tall, beak-nosed humanoid male over here. He's wearing the tight skull cap, which comes up very often in cases around Area 51, Hawaii, this, this type is drawn a lot. And he was working with another cat-eyed tall blonde and the dark-haired beings during an abduction experience that uh, kept going for her for quite a while. And here is yet another blonde type that was encountered in Springfield, Missouri, March 1982, to show you how confusing this is. This is an adult uh, female who was abducted by a six foot tall, blonde haired male humanoid in a brown jumpsuit that had a winged insignia on the upper left chest. These triangles that are drawn by many people in the abduction syndrome, you would think that you would finally get answers to what did they mean? The most classic on the Eben type that we're going to talk about in more depth is a circle uh, with a triangle in it. The circle with the two overlapping triangles about the merging of two worlds is usually only associated with the tall humanoid ones. And then this patch is a variation on a theme in which there is a triangle and it can be a, what looks like a caduceus. It might be a reptile. Some abductees think it is exactly the caduceus we use in medicine. And others are like this one. It's either like a dragon or a winged bird. But that does come up in several cases. Southern California, 1990, the adult female drew these three non-humans after an abduction experience that she said they had light brownish yellow skin. This ties into several people that I've interviewed who said they thought they were dealing with Filipinos. The being, <laughs> the being on the right also has a triangle inside a circle on his upper right chest that is one of the most common symbols in the abduction syndrome associated with the Ebens extraterrestrial biological entities. Now, that symbol has been seen by many abductees, including Jean Robinson in Springfield, Missouri. She drew this circle around an equilateral triangle that she remembered on the left breast of her abductor's bodysuit. And we have all talked about what is the significance of the triangle and the circle symbol seen in so many encounters with the various gray-skinned and light brownish-yellow types of beings. 
Why are there different sizes, skin colors, head shapes, and eyes among the gray-skinned entities? Why are there different looking blonde types, some tall, some short? Why do some tall blonde types wear insignias of overlapping triangles in a circle, while shorter blondes have something like a bird or a snake or the caduceus inside a round insignia on their uniforms? Why do some humans report seeing standing up lizards or alligators, while others say that it does look like a standing up crocodile to them with scales all over the body? Always confusing to me has been the question, what are the relationships between various entities? And I'm going to uh, show you some more illustrations from my original taxonomy so that I can show you why I think that the menagerie of so many different kinds over the decades and centuries probably are the product of only two or three what I'll call prime intelligences. And for this presentation, I'm going to define prime intelligence as one of the top dogs behind the scenes in which in the foreground, we are dealing with many, many genetic creations, either hybrids or full-blown clones. Mount Vernon, Missouri, 1990. Pale gray entity with large slanted black eyes with a triangle on its blue uniform surrounding what looks like a crescent moon emitting energy. This was drawn by Paula Watson, who does not mind her real name being used, who had repeated abductions from 1983 onward after she and her husband Ron watched small gray-skinned non-humans float a black cow from a nearby pasture into a strange craft by a lizard guy. His hands had only four fingers, and I've been at this location, walked all of the ground with them, we talked with the farm. It was a pasture across from their house in Missouri, very rural. And when they saw what looked like a cow moving like this, if you can imagine coming out of your house and you're seeing a cow uh, floating through the air with its legs out, <laughs> what, what would you think? And uh, what, what was it that happened? Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm in another dimension. <laughs> yeah, I'm concentrating on what I remember. And uh, so they're seeing this cow moving, and that's what makes them go run in their house to get binoculars. They haven't seen the non-humans yet. They, they just don't understand how this cow is floating over this pasture across the street. <laughs> So they go and they get these binoculars and they reenacted for me in a documentary that I did. And so now they're looking and here are little grays that are moving alongside of this floating cow and they go back to a cone-shaped craft. There is a ramp, there's a door open and standing on this side, let's see if I've got this. Now that I'm going on to this one. Uh, I have a picture later. Well, how is that possible? Because they're probably changing the systems right now. That's I don't know. Should I keep going? Do you guys need that second one to go, go on? <laughs> yeah, if, does anybody back there care if this left-hand screen is off? Okay. So um, they see the little beings that we're going to assume are clones or hybrids levitate the cow right into this craft, which seemed to have a mirrored surface that was reflecting all of the trees, the grass, and the sky, so that it was only through the binoculars looking at it this way that they realized that a craft is there and the cow goes in it. And I want to emphasize that I have talked with two or three men who fought in Vietnam, and they, one, walking in the jungle, ran into what he thought were vines. And he said, Linda, when you realize that you are in a jungle in Vietnam in a war and you are going through vines and you hit something that actually hurts you when you hit it, and then you realize when you touch it, my God, this is a mirrored sphere. It's 30 feet in diameter. 
It's hidden in the vines and it's completely mirrored and it's reflecting and nobody would ever know it was there. You are in the world of extraterrestrial camouflage. It can be three, it can be holograms, it can be done with these mirror surfaces and this is exactly what happened uh, over here with uh, the, the case on, uh, that I was showing you that other one. Well, I'll just keep going because I do eventually get to show you the, one was a Bigfoot over here and one was a lizard. Now, in um, central Georgia, this goes all the way back to the 1950s. I've met this man, spent days investigating, talking, uh, extraordinary. He was a male who painted this daytime encounter at his central Georgia farm and he told me, these little guys seem to float down out of the sky. They literally seem to be able to appear and disappear, close quote. New Jersey, 1987, the same adult male saw these small beings uh, while he was at, during an abduction and he was frozen, they were going around his apartment. And he said, when they got through doing whatever their examination was, they used me like a sperm bank, quote, close quote. He had abductions since his early 20s in which sperm was collected by these same little android types. Indianapolis, Indiana, 1965, an adult female who had experienced many abductions from age four on, sketched this taller being in a long sleeve robe accompanied by three small gray entities that she saw at age 18. The abductee intuitively sensed, even back then in 1965, that the little entities back in the door here were, as she said, some kind of robot, android or machine, but this gives off the energy of a very intelligent and powerful creature. Longmont, Colorado, November 1980, tall, white-skinned, bald-headed humanoid wearing a long blue cape with a high blue collar was sketched by an adult male under hypnosis about a joint abduction with his wife in late November 1980. Like the 1987 New Jersey family, the husband and wife were lifted up in a beam of light. He said it was cerulean blue, right in their car from a car that they were uh, driving toward Longmont, Col uh, Colorado. The husband, a commercial artist, also sketched an another smaller being. The husband said that the entity's skin was actually the color of the gray sketch paper but under hypnosis, he said that he had picked out the contracting, contrasting flesh color to be different from the gray color that he should have been using. The husband was confused by the layered yellow gold color, a detail that seemed so out of place on an extraterrestrial. But other people over the past several decades have also seen and sketched robes and collars on some of their ET handlers too. The Longmont husband also sketched with charcoal a wider scene of the yellow collared entity that shows arched windows around the crass perimeter. Under hypnosis, the husband called the being, quote, the creep because it examined me and took my mind out and added something. There's more to life, more to the world. There's more to everything than anybody knows. There are more than three dimensions. Everywhere, it all works together. Everything coexists. There are different dimensions that we cannot go into." Close quote. Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, 1992. Adult male with several abduction experiences sketched another collared being that he encountered that had, quote, a flattened nose with odd ridges and eyes like a cat's. I've seen a machine hooked up to me to collect sperm after I first thought that a strange blonde woman was there, close quote, but what he interacted with, which many men end up realizing, they're interacting with three-dimensional holograms. Today, it is more clear that blonde or other females that interact, interact with male human abductees can be illusions produced by ET mind manipulation or they can be a three-dimensional projected hologram 
or they can be a biologically cloned female entity designed specifically to collect male sperm from human males. All of these can be used to make male abductees ejaculate into sperm collecting devices. And that issue of three-dimensional holograms being used in the, this illusion of a sexual act in order to collect sperm relates also to the carrot document that I was talking about in the lecture. Three-dimensional holograms, invisibility, and neutralizing gravity are three of the most powerful technologies that ETs use. Bakersfield, California, 1990. Adult female drew yet another purple cape with a high collar on a being that she thought was at least seven feet tall. He had a larger cranium than most human heads along with a very big and long nose. His large slanted eyes had huge vertical black pupils and gold irises and she said, quote, he was in charge of everything over everyone else, close quote, including all the smaller gray beings. Now, there's a side note here from the Betty and Barney Hill case from 1961 uh, where uh, Betty and Barney were abducted. Also, their car was taken over by some sort of a force field in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. The car was taken into trees against their will. Probably everybody in this room knows about Betty and Barney Hill. Well, what they don't realize is that Betty Hill, in an appendix to the John Fuller book about interrupted journey, describes having a dream, and vivid dreams are often after abduction events where the human mind seems to be trying to grapple with suppressed details. Betty Hill described on her abductors that she was looking at vertical pupils like a snake or cat. She also described that their noses were much larger and longer than the average sized human nose and she compared what she was looking at to Jimmy Durante. <laughs> and Durante was that famous 20th century singer named, nicknamed the Schnoz for his large beaked nose. This is a theme that runs through the abduction syndrome and on Monday I will be getting into what the government refers to as the archaloids, cloned or hybrids made by the Ebens with these large noses and with a very fascinating assignment on this planet. Jacksonville, Florida, 1964. Here's another very prominent cranium that was sketched by an adult male encountered in an abduction at age four. He said the being was about five feet tall, had no ears, small mouth, tight-fitting clothes, was the color of the uh, the jumpsuit that was royal blue with magenta colors and very long fingers. New Hope, Pennsylvania, September 1985. New York City adult male drew this being and craft at night after an encounter in New Hope on the Delaware River. Quote, female entity about five and a half feet tall, very thin with pure white skin, was standing about 30 yards away. Her body seemed to glow in a translucent colored light consisting of blues and reds. Her eyes transfixed me and I felt as though my mind was being looked through. I was under the absolute control of this entity who was accompanied by three little creatures in blue coat uniforms with what looked like odd black netting over their faces. Missouri, October 1976. Adult male sketched this non-human after he was abducted with his wife and one-year-old daughter and said, quote, I had no control over my thoughts. The being took everything from my mind, but I knew nothing about him, close quote. Central Georgia, 1950s, praying mantis encountered by a young male at his family's Georgia farm when he was eight years old. He associated the praying mantis with small gray beings, which he thought were some kind of robots. He felt that they were not living life forms as we would know, and that they were programmed to do work for the praying mantis types. 
The same eight-year-old also saw a little gray entity behind two glowing face praying mantis creatures at his farm in the 1950s. Covina, California, 1963. 17-year-old female teenager abductee taken by a large praying mantis to a room filled with sparkling yellow-white light. Quote, praying mantis being in light-filled room, I remember the being slowly coming around the corner and facing me. He stood very still and simply waited as if he knew how frightening he appeared to me. Eventually, he began to talk to me in my mind telepathically. He seemed to possess a great deal of dignity and gave the impression of being quite old. He walked me to this room filled with dense light. The memory ends with me about to enter that room and the thought that I would be translated into the light it has to do with what happened, close quote. This is an incredible case. I go into it in some 35 or 40 pages in Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2. This has to do with the whole issue of what are our body containers? What is our soul spirit entity? And what is the interest of non-humans in the container versus the soul? And what are they tracking about the soul spirit entity of Homo sapiens sapien? In this experience, she got to watch what she called a soul transfer from her human body that had a diseased heart from rheumatoid fever to a healthier clone version of herself, also as a teenager. The teenage clone made by the gray beings and the praying mantis creature was preserved in a transparent tube lighted from the top and the bottom that she referred to as a resurrection technology. The cloned teenage body replaced her diseased body. She received a telepathic explanation from the praying mantis and gray being that it was vital that her soul spirit entity continue earth life in a very similar container body to the one that died. She was left with the impression that soul recycling in specific body containers was very important to those gray and praying mantis beings. Springfield, Missouri, 1980. Female abductee Jean Robinson encountered this six-foot-tall, green, scaly-skinned humanoid with large yellow irises that surrounded black vertical pupils. Jean described the chest as having bones that protruded under the scaly reptilian skin and gave the impression of body armor. Springfield, uh, Missouri, 1991. Another adult female from Missouri was in bed sleeping when she began and floating out of her bed toward a light and through the wall, which happens to many people in the abduction syndrome. She saw a repulsive looking entity with thin arms and ugly face like a giant grasshopper or alligator. But instead of a grasshopper, when she worked with a sketch artist to draw a humanoid entity with net-like scales all over its body, she said, she felt the sensation of being pulled by a force with fast movement to a reptilian humanoid, about five foot nine inches with green body that looks scaly and rough. She felt electricity going through her hands, saw pea green eyes with yellow and black vertical pupils like a cat, eyes slanted down toward the outer face, no hair, small mouth, thin arms, hands like a duck with tannish brown webbing three or four long fingers with nails on the end. After hypnosis, she felt like the reptilians need human beings to make them stronger. She said, are, they are trying to get our genes. They have a threat of dying out, inbreeding with us to see if the genes that we have can make them stronger, close quote. A very common theme in the abduction syndrome. Like so many other experiencers of the non-human uh, abduction syndrome, the Missouri abductee told me that she did not understand what the survival problem is or why Earth life should be involved as an alien species regeneration. Here we go, Springfield, Missouri, July 1983. This is the transport of the, by the two little grays of the cow that they saw floating going back into the triangular craft with something that looks like a Sasquatch on one side and a lizard guy on the other. 
And they watched the binoculars as all this closed up, this cone-shaped thing lifted up, and I got to talk with the owner of the pasture, and they didn't know anything about what had happened until Ron and Paula went over to their house and said, uh, we just saw something strange in your pasture. Are you missing any cows? He said, in fact, I'm missing a black cow. Have you seen it? And they said, we think we saw it floating in the air over your pasture <laughs> into a UFO. And this is where the human, the human family has no language for this without feeling like they're going to be criticized. How do you say, I saw a cow and it was floating three feet above your pasture and there were these little gray things and there was something that looked like a Bigfoot and something that looked like a standing up lizard and they all took this cow into this cone-shaped craft and then it just flew away. <laughs> that's why people would rather say, I'm not gonna tell anybody and that's when we lose. It's being able to understand the details of what your fellow humanity are experiencing with some other kind of intelligence that I think makes us stronger, that we should not be critical, we should not be criticizing people, and I think it is beginning to change. I hope so. Now, all of this effort, here is the, the Bigfoot close-up. It is the Bigfoot Sasquatch, as far as I know, is a distinct part of the non-humans that are interacting in the abductions because so many abductees have seen either a variation on this green type or the reddish brown type that the world knows as Sasquatch or Bigfoot in craft. And they have the distinct impression that they definitely are low on the totem pole, that there are many different levels of intelligences working for prime intelligences the Sasquatch appear to have been made specifically to do physical work on different planets. And that might explain that they have some sort of an underground base on this planet that we've never discovered and that they have the ability to disappear in a flash of light. This has happened in Montana. This has happened in Oregon. People have seen a Sasquatch right in front of them. One rancher in Montana in 1976, uh, was out uh, hunting, brought his rifle up when he came around a bend, and here was this big eight-foot tall, hairy thing standing in front of him. He shoots without any question, and the whole thing disappeared in a flash of light. I saw the whole thing written up in a sheriff's office report, disappeared in a flash of light, and talked with the deputy sheriff, and I said, how could it be biological if it disappears in a flash of light? And he looked at me and he said, Linda, if you see what we've seen, you would think that we are not dealing even with extraterrestrials, we are dealing with something from another universe. And this is, again, law enforcement doesn't have any language that's acceptable. So they put down in a sheriff's report, Sasquatch disappeared in flash of light, Case closed. <laughs> because there's nothing that they can do. It disappeared in a flash of light. And all of this effort to understand what our government knows about non-humans interacting with our planet began when I was director of special projects at KMGH-TV, the CBS station then in Denver. Beginning in September of 1979 and for the next nine months until it's first broadcast on May 25th, 1980, I was producing the television documentary, A Strange Harvest, and I was looking at North America at first and began to realize it was happening all around the world. And to, for those of you who don't have any experience, this is a very good and classic case in which you can tell and see that this jaw flesh has been removed extremely cleanly. There's no blood, there's no fluid on the ground. What you wouldn't know, and this was a detail that law enforcement asked me back in 79 and 80 if I would not report because they wanted to keep it as a reality check on cases. In this particular case, there were two teeth, molars, and this was something that the Canadian Royal Canadian Mounted Police were also tracking. They knew that they had mutilations that were bloodless, and they knew that molars 
were selectively being taken in the cattle. It was not reported in Canada. I complied for quite a while and I did not report it. But to extract molars from the jaw of a cow, in this case here, and the jaw flesh, without leaving any trace of blood is considered impossible, as well as all the other excisions that have no blood too. And one of my first meetings that I had when I began working on a project for Home Box Office, following up a strange harvest, they wanted me to do an hour special for HBO, and we were working under the working title ETs, the UFO factor. And uh, an attorney, Peter Gerson in New York, arranged a meeting for me to go to Kirtland Air Force Base to meet with an AFOSI agent. And the idea was that we were all going to get some names and addresses of a very bizarre written up encounter at Ellsworth Air Force Base in which there was a document referencing the NSA was referencing the name of a man that I knew was head of weapons testing evaluation at Kirtland. And the attorney and I agreed, I'm starting on the script for HBO, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy wanted to do fresh investigation of this case that involved, try to imagine this, you're a security guard at Ellsworth Air Force Base and a craft comes down in front of you and you have a gun, but that's all. And a door opens and some kind of an entity comes out and the security guard raises his gun and a green beam and gun completely evaporates. And the only thing on this, imagine this, He's got his fingers, but the only thing that happened was a mild burn in the hand. And this guy said, the United States government wanted that technology. So a lot of the investigations and suppression of these events are because our government wants to find out how do you send out something that looks like a laser that can evaporate a gun and not even hurt the hand. So Peter Gerson, the attorney, and I, we really wanted to investigate this, and he said there was this man at uh, Kirtland Air Force Base, worked in AFOSI, could give me the actual names and phone numbers of witnesses to this exchange of what we'll call it laser fire uh, between an extraterrestrial and a security guard. So that's why I thought that I was at Kirtland Air Force Base. But instead, of names and phone numbers for Ellsworth, Doty handed me a document from a desk drawer that looked something like this simulation that said briefing paper for the President of the United States of America on the subject of unidentified aerial craft, UACs, and the paper also referenced unidentified aerial vehicles, UAVs. The alleged presidential briefing paper was about government monitoring of an alien presence from at least World War II on, and the paper included the sentence, quote, extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. According to current Earth science, those evolving standing up primates began with Homo erectus, that's on the, uh, the uh, left about 1.8 million years ago and kept changing over time through various primate models to Homo sapien sapien after Neanderthalensis and modern human. And this took place about 30,000 to 35,000 years ago. There was an overlap for a period of time. And I would like to just share with you, I, it's a very dramatic uh, meeting that I had in 1999, December. It was put together by a man who worked at the World Bank. He knew me from conferences and conversations, and he called me up and he said, there's a man that I know retiring from the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and he has seen your book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, and he is intent upon being 
able to meet you to talk with you about the resurrection technology in chapter three. Would you be willing to travel for a meeting? I've done this half a dozen times in my life. You do not know what's going to be on the other end. But if I hadn't done those trips, I wouldn't know what I know. It's an odd thing about life. You have to use your gut and you have to decide whether you are willing to sort of jump off cliffs occasionally, hoping that the divine field will help. And in this case, the location was totally in the hands of the agent who did not want to be near his home, did not want to be near Fort Meade, had very specific parameters, and I said yes, I was willing. And where we ended up was really quite an insight. He chose where we would talk. And it was the Baltimore Wharf on a Sunday with all of those boats coming in with all of their no noisy motors, lots and lots of white noise. And he had us sit, there were three of us, sitting on a bench that was right next to the water. And he, as we sat down, at his request, he looked up and he said, I do not think that the satellites can penetrate this white noise. So th these are people, that's what they live with all the time. Is they, th they are in that mental state that some of us are just becoming conscious that the NSA has, been, uh, has the planet wired and has had the planet wired for a long time. So we are sitting there. It's very long, seven hours. It was a seven hour discussion in our bladders are what ended it. And in those seven hours, I've never discussed it, but what I want you to know is that this man was establishing for me that during his work for the Defense Intelligence Agency of the United States government for 23 years, that he described his work as the uh, monitoring and analysis of the geopolitical territorial conflicts of three different extraterrestrial civilizations on this planet and punctuated that sentence with, and they don't get along. And then he said, we have proof that two of those three have been interacting with and terraforming this planet for more than 270 million years. And I said, that's before the time of the dinosaurs. And he said, Linda, they made the dinosaurs. And then he said, what we're trying to figure out is what is the truth about 65 million years ago? Did the extraterrestrials deliberately take out the dinosaurs? Or was it really an asteroid that slammed in to what is the Chickaloo crater down in the Gulf? Meaning, he was saying to me that the government we don't trust the government. The government doesn't trust the ETs. They don't know precisely what is exactly truth, but he said that they had evidence that the terraforming was 270 million years. Let's just assume for the rest of this presentation that that is true. Then it means that you and I and seven billion others on this planet are just the latest model in a gigantic history of extraterrestrial interaction with this planet that could have meant Atlantis, Lemuria, Mu, and on and on. That there would be levels of civilizations that we don't know anything about and have never yet encountered. And why Gobekli Tepe is so important is that it is the very first time that we've gotten to 12,000 years in care careful carbon dating of a site that is as sophisticated as Gobekli Tepe without a single tool, not a sign of habitation, on a rural hill that had to have been built for some sort of reason. So the DIA guy said to me, and you might as well think about us, Homo sapien, sapien, as the 37th model of a Hoover vacuum cleaner. And he said, we are really, truly trying to understand. Neanderthal never knew it was being replaced by Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, sapien. 
None of the other preceding primates knew that they were being replaced by the successive. What is the future of Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien? Do we have an ally or, as Enlil Enki, Zeus versus the Titans, uh, the abductees in Pennsylvania, over and over comes this theme. There are life forms that have been terraforming this earth and made Homo sapiens sapien and Neanderthalensis and these other primates. And they think, one group thinks, that we are less, this is a quote, we are less than a roach because a roach evolved in a life form out of DNA without any interaction by extraterrestrials. And that there is a group that feels anything that they have made, which goes back very much to Sitchin's Enlil versus Enki. It was Enlil who said, we made them. They are our workers. I want them erased. Enki says no. Prometheus in the Titans says no. Prometheus, for some reason, felt that there was some vested interest and reason for humanity to survive. Is that the big issue hanging over this planet by conflicting geopolitical territorial issues of extraterrestrials? Just keep this in mind as we keep going forward. This is how complicated this 16-layer chess game is. Cro-Magnon Homo sapien. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Cro-Magnon Homo sapien sapien, the skull on the right, overlapped with Homo neanderthalensis 35,000 years ago. And I remember at various times hearing about a telepathic hive mind civilization that harvested sperm and egg genetic material from Earth in order to produce clone biological body containers, but for what purpose? The first time that someone tried to put the baffling puzzle pieces together for me in a more coherent picture was in October 1983, when I was still trying to go forward with the HBO project in spite of government efforts to block me. A Washington, D.C. military source who claimed firsthand interaction with at least one type of non-human agreed to talk with me, completely off the record, about the type that he knew as extraterrestrial biological entities that he called Ebens. He was aware that on April 9, 1983, at Kirtland Air Force Base that I had been shown the alleged briefing document for an unnamed U.S. president. He said that this quote that I, he had knew that I had now made in some places, he said these, th these extraterrestrial biological entities did manipulate DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. He was saying that's absolutely true. That was a true part of the document you were shown at Curlin. The military source stressed that no one in the American government with access to that knowledge ever wanted to be alive if or when such an announcement were broadcast to the world that humans are someone else's experimental androids. He told me that he had talked firsthand with a U.S. Air Force captain who received telepathic communication from one non-human at a crash site in the Roswell region in 1949, two years after the 47 events. Because the captain, more than anyone else at the crash site, could clearly uh, receive and correctly hear the telepathic thoughts from a being that was lying hurt on the ground, that captain was assigned at the spot to travel with this entity that they took up off the ground who was alive. And it's very interesting. I will just give you this detail. Try to imagine this. Because this was described to me by a man who knew this captain very well. He said, the, by then, by 49, this was a common drill. The United States government had gone through several retrievals, bodies and craft. So this was get in, get out sanitize the scene doesn't exist. That's why they were there. They're looking at 
a partially hurt craft. They can see, I believe it was four bodies that were clearly dead on the ground with lots of tumbleweeds and rocks and something had come up when, whenever this event occurred. And all he was doing, he was, he was walking toward the craft when what went through his mind, the way it was described to me, was a cry, a cry of agony. He heard it in his mind. He saw all kinds of images as if he was looking out a window and there were rocks and everything like he saw, he was made to see like a moving film in his mind, the crash. And then he felt the scream again. He could feel pain. All of this was happening in his mind in a few seconds. Pain, agony, what was happening. And his eyes are drawn to what seems to be the direction of something. And in all of this debris, he sees these two eyes that move. And it was a live being that was hurt. And they got it up, and he got the assignment that he was to stay with this being at Los Alamos for the foreseeable future because he could get all of this stuff in his mind. And this is something that you will hear from anybody who has investigated any of the abduction cases. There are people who have said that when they were children in school in the United States in the 50s and 60s, that they had special tests in school where people from the government would come and say that they were uh, assessing something for a new school program. And they would be put through a series where flashes of images would be coming at them and they're being watched by these federal people, allegedly for some new school program. But what was really going on, Whitley Strieber has also written about this, is that our government was looking for what they called translators. They wanted to find people who had this ability to get the clearest transmission of telepathic, not just the thought words, but the emotion, the images, and often when the movies come flying through the mind in relationship to non-human telepathic communication, overlaying like on top of the movie are three-dimensional gold symbols that many people in the abduction syndrome say look like Egyptian hieroglyphs. So this is a very complex download into human minds and apparently there are not many humans who can do it. So this man that I had this meeting with in Washington knew great details about this case. And he said that during the three years that the being was at Los Alamos, and the briefing paper that I was shown at Kirtland said, in 1949, a being was retrieved, was taken to Los Alamos, and died on June 18, 1952, of unknown causes. This man knew all about this, and he said that the Air Force captain they had 16 millimeter film sessions with him, sometimes daily, sometimes every other day, depending on what was going on, to get the captain's English of what was coming into his head from this Eben at Los Alamos. And that they uh, interviewed, quote unquote, through the captain about physics, astronomy, the Earth's history, the planet, the source. And he said, someday, Linda, Someday, a lot of us hope that everyone on the planet will see all of those films. We at least did an archive. And this is one of the quotes that this man told me was directly from the captain from this Eben at Los Alamos. Quote, we made you, we put you here, but you have to live it. Close quote. I typed up notes after the October 18, 1983 meeting that began with the military source talking about information gained from what they called EBA-1 and another captured being called EBA-2. And here are some brief excerpts from my October 1983 notes in Washington, D.C. EBA-2 trying to teach human scientists about their even technology. 
They use a completely different set of physical laws than ours. Our physics would not apply in their civilization, but theirs can apply in ours. The Ebens travel interdimensionally, many times faster than the speed of light, like the corner of a napkin folded to its opposite corner. There are many dimensions, two of which we might relate to, but at least a dozen we would not relate to. And I'm going to pause here to tell you one of the most interesting insights from a scientist, very successful, had a multi-million dollar lab in New Jersey. The year was around 1982. He was a Bud Hopkins case, never written about, never shown. He never wanted anybody to know. He was considered a sort of a genius at age uh, 32, 33, he had all this success. And he and his family celebrate his 33rd birthday in New York City. They are driving out of Manhattan, midnight or one o'clock, and there's a place for those of you who know, as you come out of Manhattan, there are roads that will go off sort of the Hoboken direction. There's a branch that goes uh, into a, a side road, and then there's the big main drag that goes south through New Jersey. That's where they were headed. So they're getting right to that branch. It's late enough that they aren't overcrowded by cars, but that section of road, 24-7, 365, is pretty crowded. And they all see a blinking red light in the sky. And the father, who is driving the car, the son, genius, is in the passenger seat. His mom and uh, his sister and her husband are in the back. And the father says, when did they put a revolving restaurant out here? <laughs> and the son says, with reality check clarity of the left brain that he had, Dad, that is not a restaurant that is high in the sky. And the father resists and said, no, it's, it's got to be one of those revolving restaurants like they have in Seattle. And the son says, dad, pull over. And as the car pulls over onto the shoulder, simultaneously, all of this happened at once. It takes time. The son sees one part of him moved through the window and is completely aware that his body is the, in that seat. He had by what he would ever call it, it was by, yeah, he was separated into two parts instantly and aware of both and became aware that his dad was in a suspended animation. And as he comes up through the window and he arcs up, he said, in that state of what was moving, I was moving toward that red flashing light. But my mind thought, but what's happening at the car? Shh. He's now looking at the car from whatever state he's in. He sees his body in the passenger seat. He sees his dad suspended at the steering wheel. He cannot see his mom and sister and her husband in the back. He thinks about the red light again. He's moving and coming. So, so from his point of view, in that state, thought is moving you in whichever direction a thought comes instantly. So he gets up above that red flashing light. And he said he realized suddenly, from whatever state he was in, that the red, pulse, uh, red pulsing light had this huge black donut. To him, it looked like a donut. And then he starts being, he felt, pulled down. And I've seen the videotape that Bud Hopkins did of this session. And Bud had a sofa on a wall where we, he would have people that he was working with and this scientist uh, on the videotape was laid out like normally people would. And when he starts down into this donut, he begins screaming at the top of his lungs, and he's pulling his legs and kicking and kicking. And I ask him, what 
what, what did you, what in your mind, do you remember anything about why are you kicking? He said, Linda, I'm looking down and here are 12, I believe it was 12, uh, sets of black eyes all in a circle and I am coming right down in the middle of them and I was trying with every fiber of my being to break and stop and go back up. And he said, you know, I could think myself to look at the car, I could think myself to go to the red lights, but I couldn't think myself as desperately as I was trying to stop and go the other way. And so he came down in the middle of all these black eyes. And as many abduction cases, he doesn't have linear memory. The next thing is on a table. And he's lying there and he sees the big black eyes and a gray of some sort. Might have been an even, but it's very uncertain because there's so many different types of grays. And he sees the four fingers these two long ones and this clasp around what he said looked to him like his electric toothbrush. But coming out of the bottom was a uh, cerulean blue light, which is sort of bluish green. And the hand appears to be moving slowly. And this guy had already started getting into Buddhism and he was doing meditation and all kinds of things. He'd already been doing that in his life. And so part of him said in his mind, if you concentrate everything you've got on your muscles and your nerves, you can move your arms and he said, I did that. And Linda, this is the power of the mind, of the being against everything. And he was strong. He was a strong guy. Everything, my hands came down under that force of that being and I made a circle right over my heart and the being continued and touched me above my heart with that instrument. And he remembered a, sh a pain like a shock, like when you would touch an electric fence. That's what he felt, bang. Very next memory, he's in his bed, in the house, in New Jersey, doesn't understand, there are leaves on the floor. He's fully dressed. He's got his shoes on, in bed. They've got leaves on them. He gets up, he calls, he was living with his mom and dad. He called their names, nobody was there. He's completely disoriented. He walked out, went to the front door, went out on the steps, went out on the walk that they had to a sidewalk. And then when he got to the sidewalk, he said, Linda, I began to walk fast. And I haven't ever told anybody. I didn't tell my parents. I'm telling you, I had been having chest pains for a year and I didn't want to go to a doctor. And I had not been able to run. I had not been able to play tennis without my heart hurting. And he said, I know it's stupid but I didn't want a doctor to tell me that at age 32, I had heart problems. And as I began to walk faster and faster, knowing that I had not been able to walk like this for at least a year, I began to run. I ran for two or three blocks. Linda, no pain. They fixed my heart. Why? It's like, Almost you could take all of the abduction cases of all the years to that plea. And in there, sharing that with you is inherently a repair which comes up in some of the abduction cases. There are other human repairs. If we go into this work, and the sharing publicly, and we are painting everything black and frightening and negative, it may be completely wrong. If we paint everything wonderful and angelic and peaceful, we can be very wrong. That there is a big rainbow of 
various pieces here, and that's what I, I want to leave you tonight. I think I'm supposed to end. Am I supposed to go to 9.30? Okay, I, I'm, I can keep going. Uh, but I think it's important because a lot of people this weekend have said, uh, you're trying to report facts, and I am, in a, a subject that is almost impossible to get reality check facts. And everybody wants to know, myself included, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it in between? Are we going to be eliminated? Are we going to have a future? All of these questions that are subconsciously or consciously in human minds about all of this. And as I go, uh, continue to go this next half hour in the hybrids on Monday, I want you to know that, that it is my own personal effort this is what is fueling me, is trying to understand the answers to these questions. And that I just shared with you one of several that I know about personally where human beings have had some sort of a major problem, medical problem, and they have been healed. In this case, this scientist who I've always been in contact with, extraordinary information has come to this man, he has his own lab. He's working in a part of the world. He doesn't want, he may or may not make the breakthrough that he wants in extraterrestrial technology. But nevertheless, he has come to the conclusion that those beings that dealt with him wanted him to continue to try to develop one of their technologies. You could argue that it may be self serving for the non humans in a way that we can't comprehend. Or it could be that the makers of Homo sapien, the genetically manipulated primates, that in the experimentation or the self-serving use of creating these different Hoover vacuum cleaners, that the beings themselves have reached a point where they want this more intelligent and very creative life form to stand on its own two feet. And for us to do that, we have to know the truth. I am convinced that continuing on a planet where there are policies of lies, both from the government and from the ETs, is just weakening us. And so I'm going to continue with this presentation into some difficult material, uh, and I will continue it on Monday I just want you to know that I have, I have no hard evidence in any way of whether the Ebens, the standing up alligators, all of the various talls want to help us, want to hurt us, or are neutral and indifference to the plights of the earth could also be, end up being negative. The agendas of these beings, I'm laying out the taxonomy to try to show you how complex it is. The agendas behind each of these types is what we really need to know. If the government is confused, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, now con continuing with this Washington discussion. He said, In number three, all Ebens look alike. The society on their planet, supposed to be in the Zeta Reticuli binary solar system, about 39 light years from Earth. This seems to be a constant theme from Betty and Barney Hill on through to this day. That it is worldwide and their leaders are for life. But every Eben has a different personality, and I wrote in my notebook question mark, question mark. Four, the Ebens brought five different humanoid species. Are they juvenile delinquents, question mark? This is a question that he raised. These are my notes from his discussion. To this planet Earth a long time ago, our whole planet is a sociological experiment. That's why the Ebens persist in the guardian versus, role versus the renegade blonde Swedes and others. He was defining 
when I had this meeting in 1983, interestingly enough, he said the Swedes, the Nordics, were troublemakers to our government. Others would argue that the Nordics, the Swedes, may be the only allies that we have. Again, the layers of contradictions are huge. The problem is, if the Ebens go away from Earth, what will happen? They have a computer base in our moon, which was the whole Brian Scott case, was about our moon is artificial, was placed, uh, the, uh, the whole thing of solar eclipses was planned, and that inside of the moon are alien computers that are monitoring and uh, absorbing information from this planet always. They have a computer base in our moon and throughout our solar system. Is that sufficient monitoring to keep the blonde Swedes in check? Remember, this was the government slant in 1983 that the Nordics were the troublemakers and the Ebens were our friends. He said that the Swedes, quote, have all of their menagerie of cloned biological entities, which was changed later as we kept evolving in time to the Evens making all of the menagerie of the greys and that the blondes are in some sort of an alliance with uh, these other tall humanoids that would not be cloned, allegedly would not be a clone menagerie. He said about the presidents of the United States, Truman, 1945 to 1953, knew everything at the time. Ike, 1953 to 1961, knew but put the lid on. Kennedy, 1961 to 63, wanted to tell the world and was killed for it on November 22nd, 1963. There's much that I could tell you that I have learned privately. I do think that this was a United States inside decision by people trying to ride the difficult extraterrestrial story and they felt that a president of the United States was a bigger national security threat than his life and that he was murdered to keep the extraterrestrial story away from the public that Kennedy wanted to share. And remember it was Robert Kennedy who has the famous quote, he wanted to shred the Central Intelligence Agency into a thousand pieces and cast it to the wind and he was killed also. LBJ, 1963 to 69, didn't want to know because he heard rumors about what happened to Kennedy, meaning if there's a link between trying to investigate extraterrestrials and the outcome is assassination, then LBJ didn't want to have any interest or know anything that could get him killed. Nixon, 1969 to 1974, knew and bragged about his inside knowledge to friends. He did show Jackie Gleason some retrieve craft and ET bodies preserved in tubes that were hanging on walls underground at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. And when he said that, he said the tubes are hanging on the wall this way and that we have a variety of extraterrestrials that are dead inside of these tubes and in other rooms there are different craft, and he said it is exactly like a Walt Disney Museum of real extraterrestrials and real UFOs. Gerald Ford, 1974 to 1977, don't know if he knew anything. Carter, 1977 to 1981, he was briefed in 1976 and again later on, but decided the story was too big to deal with. Remember, it was Jimmy Carter who talked about his own UFO encounter and said if he became president, he would tell us everything. Well, there is something about the briefings that shut presidents down. Reagan, 1981 to 89, was briefed during the campaign because he was so pro-military that MJ-12 wanted to quiet him down. And Monday, I will be going into uh, even more of what I'm going to share with you tonight about that. This was a quote at that uh, meeting in Washington. Reincarnation. Only so many souls are allowed per planet, recycled constantly at birth and death. And it's like the captain uh, with the Eben that said, reincarnation is the machinery 
uh, reincarnation, the recycling of souls, is the machinery of the universe. Uh, that was another one of the direct statements of allegedly from the Ibn at Los Alamos. I didn't know then, in 1983, who to trust or what to believe. So I didn't do anything in public at all with this material that I'm sharing with you tonight. And then a decade later, an alleged 1950s government document was leaked on March 7, 1994, called Restricted Psalm 01 Majestic 12 Group Special Operations Manual, Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal, Top Secret Magic Eyes Only, Warning. This is a top secret magic eyes only document containing compartmentalized information essential to the national security of the United States. Eyes only access to the material herein is strictly limited to personnel possessing magic 12 clearance level. Examination or use by unauthorized personnel is strictly forbidden and is punishable by federal law. Here is a close-up of the original U.S. War Office seal, which was being used in the date, as you can see, that this was dated in April 1954. The War Office logo was being used in 1954. Since the United States War Office was transitioned to the U.S. Department of the Army under the Department of Defense in 1949, the implication is that this Psalm 101 training manual for extraterrestrial entities and technology recovery and disposal was first produced before 1949 when, and maintained that war logo when it was published in a printing in April 1954. The unofficial leak of this Psalm 101 manual started at a La Crosse, Wisconsin pharmacy when 32 pages of text and drawings showed up on 35 millimeter negative film addressed to Don Berliner at the Fund for UFO Research in Maryland. The film was in an envelope postmarked March 7, 1994. Don Berliner gave Bob Wood, an aerospace engineer retiring from McDonnell Douglas, permission to print the negatives for study. The first frame was this cover, and on page six of the training manual is section 10, description of extraterrestrial biological entities, EBA type one and EBA type two. EBA type one, these entities are humanoid and might be mistaken for human beings of the oriental race. Remember I've said abductees said they thought that they were dealing with Filipinos. Beings of the Oriental race have seen from a distance. They are bipedal, five foot five feet, four inches in height, and weigh 80 to 100 pounds. Proportionally, they are similar to humans, although the cranium is somewhat larger and more rounded. The skin is a pale, chalky yellow in color, thick and slightly pebbled in appearance, and many people say it's like a lizard's skin. The eyes are small, wide-set, almond-shaped, with brownish-black irises with very large pupils. The whites of the eyes <coughs> are not like that of humans, but they have a pale gray cast. The ears are small and set low on the skull. The nose is thin and long, and the mouth is wider than in humans and nearly lipless. There is no apparent facial hair and very little body hair that being very fine and confined to the underarm and the groin area. The body is thin and without apparent body fat, but the muscles are well developed. The hands are small with four long digits, but no opposable thumb. The outside digit is jointed in a manner as to be nearly opposable, and there is no webbing between the fingers as in humans. The legs are slightly but noticeably bowed or bowed, and the feet are somewhat splayed and proportionally large. EBA type two. These entities are humanoid, but differ from type one in many respects. They are bipedal, three feet, five inches to four feet, two inches in height, and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. 
Proportionally, the head is much larger than humans or type 1 EBAs, the cranium being much larger and elongated. The eyes are very large, slanted, and nearly wrap around the side of the skull. They are black with no white showing, there is no noticeable brow ridge, and the skull has a slight peak that runs over the crown. The nose consists of two small slits, which sit high above the slit-like mouth. There are no external ears. The skin is a pale bluish-gray color, being somewhat darker on the back of the creature and is very smooth and fine-celled. There is no hair on either the face or the long body, and these creatures do not appear to be mammalian. The arms are long in proportion to the legs, and the hands have three long tapering fingers and a thumb which is nearly as long as the fingers. The second finger is thicker than the other. Think of Spielberg, E.T. Maybe he was trying to tell us something. Remember this finger that had the red bulb that would come on and it was thicker? Probably some of these details from these manuals were given to Spielberg. The second finger is thicker than the other, but not as long as the index finger. The feet are small and narrow, and four to toes are joined together inside of a membrane. In mutilations in New Mexico and Colorado, at mutilation sites, twice there have been tracks that have been written in law enforcement that it looked like there were ice cream cone tracks near the mutilated animal's body. These feet are small and narrow, and four toes are joined together inside of the membrane. That would be the ice cream cone that tapers down to a very tiny heel. Those prints have been photographed at mutilation sites. It is not definitely known where either type of creature originated, but it seems certain that they did not evolve on Earth. It is further evident, although not certain, that they may have originated on two different planets, close quote, from the short taxonomy in the Psalm 101 training manual, which everybody, Bob Wood, uh, Stanton Friedman, all of us who have dealt with this uh, since it was first released in the 35 millimeter negative, we are convinced this is real, this is a leak, uh, that the, uh, the, the Psalm 101 was a training manual, manual being used for crews that were going out to retrieve craft and extraterrestrial bodies dead and alive. Today, I can add the probability that EBA-1 types genetically manufactured EBA-2 types to do work on this planet. And that means abductees have usually been handled by the small, large, black-eyed little guys, not the prime EBA intelligence behind the genetically cloned biological entities or androids. The cloned biological entities of various types made by Ebens and other extraterrestrial types recently emerged with more details about five different non-human species allegedly presented in a briefing for U.S. President Ronald Reagan. This release, 27A Reagan Briefing, was included in a series of 35 reports from 2005 to 2007 posted in order, quote, to facilitate the gradual release of confidential documents pertaining to a top secret exchange program of 12 U.S. military personnel to Serpo, a planet of Zeta Reticuli between the years 1965 to 1978. The information began to be released on 2 November 2005 by a retired senior official within the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, known as DIA, who calls himself anonymous. Until he chooses to make his name known, this is the way he will be represented here. Anonymous reports that he is not acting individually and is part of a group of six DIA personnel working together as an alliance three current and three former employees. He is their chief spokesman, close quote. The following excerpts are allegedly from a transcript of a tape recording made at Camp David, Maryland for President Ronald Reagan on March 6 and March 8, 1981 
about the subject of, quote, unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial visitation of Earth, close quote. Leading the discussion was William Casey, along with CIA advisors and a caretaker of the ET history. Casey was Reagan's campaign manager in 1980, and President Reagan asked Casey to become the CIA director from 1981 to 1987. That means that this briefing, March 6 to 8, 1981, was only two months after Ronald Reagan first took office on January 20th, 1981, as President of the United States. The caretaker. The United States of America has been visited by extraterrestrial visitors since 1947. We have proof of that, close quote. That is not the truth to the President of the United States. There were crash retrievals at least as early as 1941 uh, at Cape Girardeau, Missouri. How many others were there before 1947? We know that in February of 1942 in the famous Battle of Los Angeles that there were documentation between FDR and uh, the Secretary of War, George Marshall, that on that night that all that artillery was photographed and made the front page of the Los Angeles Times and was tied into were the Japanese now getting to the shores of California and the United States after what they had done at Pearl Harbor and what was in the photograph was a diamond, a glowing white diamond with all of this artillery flak going up against it. Well, within February to March, there were several memos that were uh, communicated between Secretary of War George Marshall and FDR, then president, about celestial plan forms, celestial beings, and that we were able to take down two of the celestial craft over San Bernardino and Santa Monica on the night of the Battle of Los Angeles. How many of you have know this? How many of you have seen these documents? Well, at least a few. That's good. Yeah, in the document what the, between Marshall and FDR, it says right there, two, one in San, the San Bernardino area and one in Santa Monica Mountains. So this means that this, this sentence to Reagan, visited by extraterrestrial visitors since 1947, was political spin for Reagan. It was not representing at all the truth. And I think for all of us who have had any interactions with people who have served in, served in government agencies, you get the impression that the intel world considers presidents to be something they have to deal with, but they do not, under any circumstances, brief presidents after Eisenhower with the full truth of anything. So you're getting an insight right here from the, from the beginning. They were trying and have been trying to draw a line in the sand that 1947 was the beginning. We had visitors. We've been learning that we're not alone in the universe. They went away. There's no problem. Well, not exactly. The caretaker. However, we also have some proof that Earth has been visited for many thousands of years by various races of extraterrestrial visitors. Now, they're getting back on an honest track that begins to be a little consistent with what the DIA guy told me, that they have some kind of proof that they've been here, three of them, three civilizations, for more than 270 million years, or at least 270 million. So at least... He's now saying to Reagan, thousands of years. Mr. President, I'll just refer to those visits as ETs. In July 1947, a remarkable event occurred in New Mexico. During a storm, two ET spacecraft crashed. One crashed southwest of Corona, New Mexico, and one crashed near Dadel, New Mexico. The U.S. Army eventually found both sites and recovered all of the debris and one live alien, and I will refer to that live alien as EBA-1. This is the one that went to Los Alamos, had the telepathic communication, and uh, 
and EBA, uh, I think EBA 2 is the one that they, he felt the pain from. What does that mean? Uh, the president, Reagan says, what does that mean? Do we have codes or a special terminology for this? The caretaker. Mr. President, EBA means extraterrestrial biological entity. It was a code designated to this creature by the U.S. Army back in those days. This creature was not human, and we had to decide on a term for it. So scientists designated the creature as EBA-1. We also referred to it as NOAA. So interesting that they would have chosen that name, because if you took the biblical literature absolutely literally, every single one of seven billion humans, if we were just Homo sapiens sapiens, can only be traced back to Noah because the flood destroyed all life on the planet, according to the biblical literature. That means every single primate human after from Noah is only linked back to Noah. Noah would be the new Eden. There was different terminology used by various aspects of the U.S. military and intelligence community back then meeting 47. President Reagan, can we classify them? Can we connect them with anything earthly? The caretaker, no, Mr. President, they don't have any similar characteristics of a human with the exception of their eyes, ears, and a mouth. Their internal body organs are different. Their skin is entirely different from human. We could not classify any part of the alien with humans. They had blood and skin, although considerably different than human skin. Their eyes had two different eyelids, probably because their home planet was very bright. P President Reagan, is time the same on their planet as ours? That's a very unusually sophisticated question for Reagan, I thought. <laughs> the caretaker no, Mr. President, time is very different on the Eben planet, which, by the way, we call Serpo. And I looked up. Serpo in Latin means to creep or crawl, and I think that all of the strange skin and internal organs of the Ebens is reptilian. Their day is approximately 40 hours. That is measured by the movement of their two suns. The solar system contains Serpo. containing Serpo is a binary star system or two suns rather than one like our solar system, the caretaker. The distance from Earth to Serpo is about 40 light years. They can travel that in about nine of our months. I'm no scientist, but as I mentioned earlier, they can travel that great distance by means of space tunnels. They seem to be able to bend the distance from one point in space to another. Just how they do this must be explained scientifically. Ronald Reagan, are they all friendly? That's what we would all like to know. Advisor number one, Mr. President, that is a very difficult question to answer. There are many parameters that we follow to evaluate the threat. However, we have little intelligence on four of the five. We have plenty of intel on the Ebens. They've given us everything we ask for. Interesting that the Ebens are defined as our maker, and they are the ones that are collaborating with the human government the most. They have also helped us to understand the other four species. I'm afraid to say, Mr. President, and please don't misunderstand my words, but we think one of the species is very hostile. William Casey, director of the CIA. Mr. President, we have intelligence that would indicate this one species of aliens have abducted people from Earth. They have performed scientific and medical tests on these humans. To the best of our knowledge, no humans have been killed. But as advisor number one stated, the intelligence is from witnesses, and we have not thoroughly evaluated this intelligence. We have captured one of these hostile aliens. This gets into some very, very sensitive areas, Mr. President. I strongly suggest we end this discussion 
and move on to any further questions that you might have and then get back to this. I don't think we are prepared to provide you with accurate answers to your questions about the potentially hostile aliens at this time, which was March 6 to 8, 1981. And I want to do the break here because there's much more to go and I'm going to do it in Monday because the issue of one hostile alien and four others of which they define three, one even, and the next two made by the Ebens, so that three of four that are considered not dangerous are all made, are Ebens or made by Ebens. The fourth is not identified for reasons unknown. The fifth is the strange hostile one, and I will pick up there on Monday for the three-hour intensive. And I would like to ask, before we close out, how many of you, and I'm serious, I really want your help, how many of you think that what I presented tonight is helpful or hurtful? Oh. Seriously. I... I, uh, I just want you to know how much I agonize about, in the public, I want the truth out. But put yourself in my shoes. I don't want anybody to leave this room feeling scared. I'm not. I'm not scared. I do not feel any fear. I feel that whatever is going on on this planet has been going on for so long that if dangerous or not, if the Ebens had wanted to annihilate us, like Enlil and uh, the uh, Titans, it could have happened 35,000 years ago. We've never existed. And there was a very wonderful woman who came up to me before I started, and she asked a question which I hope we can all talk about tomorrow because you could help me in this dynamic, and she said, if we were made by extraterrestrials, do we have a soul? And why a discussion about soul recycling if we didn't have a soul? And if we have a soul, how did we get a soul if extraterrestrials made us? That really does go to the heart of a certain kind of angst in all of this. And I would like on Monday to share with you some things that have been shared with me along those lines and to leave you tonight with a, a sense that I have always had since I was 21 years old hiking in mountains in Idaho. And I was on a mountain I had hiked it many times before. My brother and a cousin were down on a river. And I got up to the top of the mountain. I loved hiking this mountain. And the sun was going down because I did these hikes in the morning and the afternoon. And I noticed that there were these orange beams of light that were coming down through the ponderosa pine. And they seemed to have substance to them. And I remember that I, I just, the thought that went through my head was I have never seen light so beautiful. And I started walking toward these beams and it was like I went into 96 frames very slowly. I have no memory of reaching the beams. And the next thing I know, it is a bit of missing time, but I don't associate it at all with non-humans. I associate it with something in the divine field. I'm down further on the hill, and I see one of the little June summer flowers is pulsing light, and it was an orchid white light, and it had sparks coming off, and it was right down by my foot. And I didn't feel fear as much as I want everything to come back to normal. And I started running, thinking I'll run and then everything will be normal and I won't have to worry about the pulsing light flower. And when I stopped, 
Every flower, as far as I could see, was pulsing this light. And behind me, the mountain that I'd come down looked just like Van Gogh's painting at the end of his life when he had the energy, starry night, just exactly like that. And the, and the whole mountain seemed to be breathing. It actually had an up and down. It was not subtle. It really seemed to be breathing. And there were stars because the sun had gone down. And up there in the mountains, you can see a few little early stars when the sun goes down. They're pulsing the same orchid white light as the flowers. And suddenly, this feeling of pressure, it actually seemed to have a slight temperature. I had been standing there absolutely stunned and in awe of what is happening around me when it felt like this warm jello lifted up my arms and my hands and I found my hands in front of me. I had nothing to do with this, meaning I was not lifting my hands. Something else was. And as my hands got in front of me came this thought voice as clear as can be. You are one with the light. The light is one with you and you were in the hands of God forever. And then, well, I'm sharing this because I want you to have these words because I think this does apply to all of us in the big picture. When my hands were released, I still am not in control. My hands are released. And it was like a rheostat, 10, 9, like 10 seconds, very slowly, all of the pulsing light and the breathing mountain, it just like that. And now I'm standing in the same place. I haven't moved. Reality is back. I wanted things to be normal. But at that moment, to this day, I was changed forever. Because whatever the divine field wanted what it accomplished for me, one of the little specks in the universe, is that this, what, what you were just showed, is the true reality. The physicist Bohm said, all matter is frozen light. If you can hang on to those kinds of thoughts, you are one with the light, all matter is light, then no matter what lands on Earth, no matter what comes, if you can hang into that place that's inside of you and stays solid and doesn't get down on its knees in front of extraterrestrials and calls them semi-gods or anything, then I think that's where humans can get past these crossroads that we're in facing now and chaos on our own planet, the overwhelming violence that humans seem to be plunged into. And that on the other side of what I just told you is this question. If the DIA guy was right and there are three competing extraterrestrial biological entities on this earth and they have been here for a long time, how many of the wars, especially in the name of gods and religion, are manipulated by forces that use us in a battle that is a battle between them? I suspect that something like that is happening on this planet, and that is what fuels me. Because this then is a liberation effort. No matter who made humans, no matter whether we are androids, we are conscious, intelligent beings with souls. And if this is a universe where there are advanced intelligences that make humanoids, and then put them into service on plants, planets. When we become conscious of them, it seems to me we are owed freedom. Because right now, if we are on a planet where geopolitical territorial conflicting forces are working out their battles through their human androids, and then you have the 1% of the human greed that keeps the 99% of humans basically at their slavery. Jim Mars, I think, describes it well. We have two levels in which we need as a species, if we're going to continue in this universe, to be free from the 1% power greed 
and whatever is going on in the extraterrestrial conflict. And that's why I shared with you that story of what happened to me in Idaho, because that is what gives me strength to keep going in this 16-level chess game. And I hope that you will remember some of these words and it will keep you going no matter what does happen because I do think there is a divine field that cares that we survive.